Welcome to Autism ADHD TV. It is the place to be for parents and professionals. I'm your host, Holly Blanc Moses, the mom psychologist who gets it. We dive into all kinds of important information like behavior, social skills, and learning. All right, let's get started. Thanks for joining me for part two of Temple Grandin's episode on special interests. If you haven't listened to part one, go ahead back and listen to part one first. You are going to love it. And believe me, you don't want to miss anything. So let's get started with part two. See you in the episode. And so supporting children in their interests and exposing them, and then also paying attention to this is a great opportunity to find other people that have those same interests and they exactly and i find them in the shops and then then there's the mathematical mind and i've seen situations where parents have an eight or a ten year old's brain in math and he's got an autism diagnosis and they're so stuck on the diagnosis i said you're both programmers why don't you teach your kid programming and they go oh that's a good idea they hadn't thought about it they were too much stuck in the medical model to think about teaching their kid programming Let's find that video game you like so much, Minecraft, that runs on JavaScript. Let's learn some JavaScript. The screens on the SpaceX Dragon capsule run on JavaScript. I actually found websites where you can get into how those are programmed. I don't okay. understand the programming, but I found the websites. Yeah, my you know, husband, your kid involved in that. My husband, who is on the spectrum, he he started coding at eight. So, and that was a long now, we time We need to ago. be introducing coding early. Yeah, that was, you know, I mean, he's 46. So, um, you know, it's it's exciting to be able to, again, notice those interests and then introduce them to possibly other kids who have the similar interest. I like out school. I'm not sure if you've ever heard of it, but you can go in there and search your interest. Clubs come up, classes come up. Um, we, our, our oldest son, who's very into rap music, which I've had to learn more about because I don't know much about okay, it. Yeah. He took rap classes. All right. Well, good. Well, then and, that's something yeah. you can do with other other students. Exactly. You know, I mean, I have my things I tend to get turned on about. Um, but um, there, but the, see, this is what I think the big problem in education today, kids are not getting exposed to enough different things. So I, maybe and, that could be the challenge that we put out with this episode. So if parents are watching, if um, teachers, therapists are watching to really support those interests and then make- You have to, but sometimes they got an interest that's real narrow, but exposed to other things and we switch that interest over something that's better than video games, you know, like maybe tools and programming would be another one. Yeah. You see, you've got your visual thinkers like me. We, we like the mechanical stuff. Also art graphic design, animation. And then you've got the more mathematical mind that's gonna be programming, the more traditional engineering, but the more traditional engineering me needs, needs my kind of mind too. And then you have um, the word thinkers. You know, let's expose them to some literature that's worth reading. Exactly. You know, and you it's, can do uh, lyrics. And and okay, let's say the kid, okay, the kid likes rap music. Okay, let's learn how to play it. I'll le learn how to sing it. Yep. And yep. let's, and then, okay, you caught, you learn how to, you know, copy existing songs and then you uh, make up some original ones because I want to start getting original things. Yeah, he writes the lyrics. And, and it's uh, good. You've got to get exposed. See what, so what's happening in some states, and it's a big difference between states, is uh, all they care about is, is testing. We've got a big problem today with students not being taught writing skills because the thing that helped me a lot in my career was I'd write about my projects. Oh, putrid grammar, putrid graduate students. And they're smart students. And when I question them, I find out they never wrote a book report. And they never had to mark up their work. Oh my goodness. No, I am serious. And I have talked to a lot of professors about this. And one of the things that helped me be influential in the livestock industry is I wrote about my projects. 
And I have to correct, and I've taken students' journal articles and I'm correcting them. I said, I'm going to get your writing from awful to useful. <laughs> so you can write a coherent memo about something. I know yeah. sometimes they'll say that writing is difficult, but I think if you're writing about something you're passionate about. But you have to learn how to explain it clearly. Let's just right. take right. an experiment you do. And, and you've got to explain what you did. The breed of the animal. Okay, let's say it's nutrition call. The breed of the animal, the way you came in, what did you feed it? Um, I, re I reviewed a paper recently um, on some cattle behavior stuff. And there was no description of a, you know how cattle stick their head through into a trough? Mm -hmm. Well, the design of that thing can affect their feeding behavior. Oh, I had no they idea. Didn't, well, they didn't tell me what feed rack they used. I said, if it's commercially available, name it. If it's a homemade one, put a picture in. Because this is one of the problems we have on replicating research results. A different design of the feeding bar, the thing they stick their head in when they eat, can change the results. And it changes how much little fights you get between cattle and stuff. It can change the results. I've got to know what what would you feed them? Oh, that's so interesting. But and I also just have to have a clear writing about what you did. And I what I suggest the students read your paper out loud like you're giving a speech. Read it without read it out loud. And then you go, ugh. I wouldn't say it like that. <laughs> but I want to see kids get out and be successful. And I'm at well, over a year, my first big food plant visit. Well, I had a great time. I was geeking out on a little packaging machine. That was made in a little local shop, really cool. They just had it custom built. They didn't want the big monstrosity that cost a zillion dollars. They wanted a nice one that wasn't any, it was le less wide than my kitchen. And it could package these small packages of meat. I, yeah, I think that's really, and I'm gonna bet you if I went back to the shops, um, you know, let's spot the person on the autism spectrum there. And they're get you see, but kids are growing up in Nebraska exposed to tools and stuff. Well, in I in other parts of the country they're not. That's true. And that's true. And so I'm I'm hopeful again for with this episode, we're gonna be able to provide some great ideas as you know how to support those interests, how to get creative, how well, the other thing is I want to bust up the medical model. Okay, I'm gonna apply the medical model to a Delta Airlines jet, one that I was on, one that I almost got on, um, that had a mechanical issue. To show you what gobbledygook it sounds like, to talk about mechanical problems in planes in medical terminology. Well, we were just getting ready to board and they said they had delay boarding. So I went over to the next gate where I could get a window to watch the show. And I watched three mechanics clustered around the nose wheel of this airplane, a pilot on the end of the jet bridge talking to him as he's seen something he didn't like on walk around, couldn't hear the conversation. And then they get this little step ladder and they take the aviation illumination probe and they're up inside the front wheel compartment shining the aviation illumination probe around. 45 minutes of consultation, three different people. Then the head mechanic from the Delta hospital comes down the ladder and he doesn't move the ladder. I go keep going. But they, they, can't, they didn't cancel the flight, but that plane was grounded. Well, she had a micro bleed in the anterior proximal rotary appendage. She had a micro bleed in the anterior proximal rotary appendage. That's good gobbledygook. I can tell you exactly what she had. All hydraulic systems leak a little bit, always a little bit. And the pilot, I'm pretty sure, because I couldn't hear the conversation, but I got to watch this show, um, saw a little leak. And then you have to make a decision, is she safe to fly with this leak? You see, because it's a little, you, you can't, there's always going to be some grease around the oil around the hydraulic uh, rods. And uh, they were, so they were discussing, could she fly or not? And they decided after a big discussion, she was not going to fly. She had to go to the hangar. That has to be fixed in the hangar. But it sounds kind of silly, 
when I talk about that in perfect medical terminology. And when, you know, it's really fun. I like to tell the anatomy students, look up what the words mean in Latin. They mean really dumb things. <laughs> like the brain is full of almonds. It has a seahorse. It's got olives in it. I go, really? Well, they just named it after what stuff looked like. <laughs> That's true. Oh, I'm serious. And we get too hung up on this. And the other problem we've got with the autism spectrum is you're going from Elon Musk, who I can name now because he's disclosed on Saturday Night Live, to somebody who might have something called Duck 15Q, which I didn't even know about until recently, which is uh, going to be, you know, remain nonverbal, uh, often has severe epilepsy, uh, have difficulty learning basic skills. And in a lot of places that gets labeled autism. So you've got this huge spectrum. We've all got the same name and the verbal thinkers get hung up on the name. You see, I'm seeing different people. I'm seeing people I worked with in shops that I know are, are autistic, undiagnosed. They're just as autistic as they can be. And they got 20 patents each. One has a huge shop. He sells the stuff around the world. He's still selling it. That's what makes me go crazy as I go back and forth between the worlds. And I want to see kids get out. And the most funnest stuff I ever did in the world was some, some of the building stuff. That is really cool. And I know and, that lots of kids and it, Legos uh, and... I love solving problems. Mm -hmm. Well, I've got the chicken problem that, like well, I said... I just go in the store and I have the rotisserie chickens. <laughs> rotisserie chicken problem that I'm going to yeah, they, they you know go in the Costco and look at the rotisserie chickens people tie that on there by hand it's kind of an elastic kind of a string automate it all right where you know what that, I have that, that's the job for the clever engineering department exactly, exactly. and I can uh, I could probably help them get that transferred to the industry and get some help and get a patent on it and it will be bought instantly. I think you're going to have some tangers. As long as it's not ridiculously expensive. Right. Cheaper, efficient. No, the thing is, you got you got three ways you can automate something like that. And it's a complicated task. I, uh, You can do a true intelligent robot that has hands like a person that does it. That's made very expensive with things that food plants are very wet. And the uh, you can protect the robot arm, but the tool... If it's got electronics in it, that's not going to work in a food processing plant. Or you can do something where you do it in, in a station, so like maybe several stations, it's done in steps. Uh, the other thing to look at, do I totally automate it or partially automate it? Where, I, where a person gives it a little bit of help. That will probably be the easiest, but that's the three ways that you could do it. Do it. Figure out how to tie those chickens. Uh, and, that, and it's raw chicken, obviously. You have to raw whole chicken. Figure out how to tie that. And uh, and you really think up something good. You might actually, it would, because uh, it's not a fun job. It's a lot of. Yeah, that would not be an easy job. No, it's not an easy job. And, but that's, uh, I would probably go person helping a little bit. It's easier to do it. it and then sense. there's one step where a person does this and, but then, you know, when we brainstorm about how to do stuff, and then you get the guy in the shop that just tinkers around and he does it. He figures it out. And I can assure you that the roach that he tinkers with has got to get thrown in the garbage. <laughs> in the shop. I've, I've been, you know, I, Nobody's gonna want any pet. Oh my goodness. I am smiling so much, my face hurts. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much for, for coming on with me today. I really appreciate it. I'm gonna figure out the chickens. I'm going to go get the anvil today and I'm um, probably gonna work on some rap lyrics too. And then we have to teach them how to use tools safely. Yes. Well, when I was a young kid, you know, always held, you don't run with scissors and you hold them with a the point down. Right. 
Uh, you don't point stuff at people's eyes. Uh, you know, for a lot of things you want to wear eye protection, Would, but you learn how to use them safely. And, and for some kids, that's the way to go. Another kid's going to be the programming route. Yeah. Another kid is going to be acting or theater. I talked to one mom, her kid loved dancing. And I said, well, she needs to go to a dance class. You know, so we're different. But you see, this is why I think it's so important for schools to keep all these things, because then kids get exposed and they go, well, I hated that. I talked to one guy, he owns a big metal fabrication shop. And uh, when he's a terrible student, autistic, dyslexic, ADHD, stutterer, loved welding, hated carpentry. Mm. But you see another person's gonna love the carpentry or another person's gonna wanna act in plays or do you know sewing. I, I, when we were at this factory, one of the guys said he couldn't even sew on a button. Well, you know, and we're going to have to solve problems. You got a pipeline mess. Well, they better learn how to run that thing manually. And they also need to make sure there's no way the computer can force that pipeline into dangerous mode of operation mm -hmm. where it could damage the pipeline. Definitely. I mean, I've been, we I kind of lay awake about this stuff. It needs some old fashioned mechanical controls that if it gets to where it, too much pressure or something, it will have an automatic mechanical shut off. Well, I'm, I am hopeful that they will be able to work something out. It definitely was. Um, you see, I see it. I'm, I'm like going, Ugh, let's say we got some raw whole chicken out in the shop because we're going to experiment with some stuff. <laughs> I'm not going to want to eat it after the a whole bunch of stuff on it. And it's not refrigerated. I want to throw that raw, raw chicken in the trash. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You see, I'm seeing that, but that's the kind of stuff you'd have to do to kind of figure out, first of all, you brainstorm an idea and then you try something and you're going to wreck a lot of rocks <laughs> while you're trying it. And it's all about the learning. And the well, that's right. Figuring it and, out. And, and what, fact, what happens with these little shops is they have a little tiny shop. A factory has to do something, any kind of a factory, any kind of a factory has to make something and they like it. And then they say, oh, well, could you do this? And they go, yeah, I'll figure out how to do this. And then some of the shops just stay small working in the community and some grow into, they'll, they'll invent something. And then that turns into their business. See, that's what, what happens. Little guys innovate, big companies are too clumsy to innovate. Little shops innovate. Little places make innovative programs. Little places, uh, do the stuff that's really innovative and they grow big then they get too clumsy to innovate but then when they need help they get the little shops to come in and invent something for them i saw some of that yesterday really nice stuff made by little shops love it love it i was looking them up online this morning i'm glad you got a chance to do that man i was just like going crazy like, I, you know, I want to get out. See, I really loved going on my second trip since COVID and visiting the autism camp and getting these kids off of them, um, off the video games. There's no tech in those cottages. Uh, you know, that was really good seeing that, learning about that. Because I want to, I mean, I think, you know, what would you rather do in life? I mean, my mind likes to solve problems. I find a lot of stuff with People's emotional stuff is extremely boring. But I like to solve problems because this whole thing about this pipeline shutting down. I'm going, we've got to make sure that, um, that, you know, I can visualize stuff they could do to it. And I've got to make sure that that doesn't happen. Fortunately, all those hackers wanted was money and the pipeline company paid them off. I just read that in today's Wall Street Journal. Definitely, it's been interesting how you, how your mind works and you're thinking about, you know, how can we make sure that doesn't happen or how can that be manual? And I think about, you know, as a psychologist, I think about how people are under stress, they're responding to- um, Well, stress, I just looked gas, at- it. Getting gas. Well, I'm, well, like you see, whether you've got equipment like that, it's very expensive. It's also gonna be very dangerous equipment. 
And you've got to make sure it's not pushed into getting too hot, too much pressure, where something could get severely damaged, maybe catastrophically damaged. Extremely expensive to replace and also very dangerous. And I don't trust a computer with that. When things like gets too hot, it's gonna shut down. Old fashioned thermostat, can't hack that. Or it, the uh, pressure gets exceeded, it's going to shut down. Old fashioned control just to a to a solenoid switch to turn the power off. Mm. And then the, we, what I think we need to be doing is we've got to figure out how to operate that thing. If, well, I've got to do, do two things with that pipeline. I've got to make sure it's no way it can be forced into a dangerous mode of operation. And I got to figure out how to work it manually. Okay, here's another horror story. I was reading about a waterworks that somebody hacked. And this is the municipal water supply. The, the operator's sitting there watching his computer and the phantom mouse arrow, somebody else is controlling it, is moving around on his screen. And it wants to click on something to dump a whole bunch of chemicals into the water supply that would be dangerous, like unload a whole tank of chemicals into the water supply. He stopped it. But what I'm gonna do is go down to Home Depot I'm gonna buy some pipes and some fittings to put a restrictor on that tank. So no matter what the computer does, it cannot exceed the maximum dose. Because I bought a little pipe like this from Home Depot. So even if it opens the valve up all the way, it can't dump in too high a dose. Probably about $20 worth of pipes. Well, thank you, Home Depot. That's what I'm gonna do. <laughs> so I, I love that. I love that you're thinking about you know, again, it's the solving those problems. Well, yeah, because I don't trust the, every computer. I don't trust the computer on life critical things or on things where I. Uh, the only computer I can trust is one where there's no way it can be connected to the internet. Yeah, I'm going to glue all the uh, USB slots closed. Well, I. I love that idea, again, of just looking at things, supporting interests, and getting kids together who have similar interests. And it's just, it's exciting, like you said, exposure. So yeah, that's right. Again, that we've got lots of challenges with this episode, I think. So, you know, people- Well, listen I wanna get people thinking about it in a different way. And I can tell you, man, a full factory, uh, you know, get out there like a full factory experience yesterday. I liked that. That is exciting. And I, yeah, and we, we looked at a bunch of chickens too, but they, they uh, but how's a kid gonna get, okay, maybe one kid goes in a factory, goes, ugh, I don't have anything to do with this, but there's gonna be somebody else who thinks that's the coolest thing in the whole world. Right. And it's true. It's it's we there's there's not a lot of exposure, but now I'm I'm glad. Well, be, be, okay, another student that I worked with. Um, okay, she had some sandals imported from another country. I said, "How do you think those got here?" She didn't know what a container ship was. You see, we're getting we're getting students totally removed from the world of practical things. Well, that's true. Things magically appear. Well, they don't magically appear. And they ever given, he asked, well, what was on the ever given? Well, I can tell you some stuff that's not on it. Lettuce and tomatoes. You know, but put that ship in unrefrigerated shipping containers. No, electronics was the number one thing on that. Then household goods and clothing and shoes. Yeah. yeah what you buy in a store? You're right. I, I hadn't really thought about that because, you know, people now, they think, not they. I don't want to generalize, but some people think, you know, you order from Amazon, you click, and then it shows up and you don't think about how it was made or how it got. I well, mean, the other thing, somebody gets mad about a warehouse getting built by next to them. Now, just last night, coming home from the airport, I saw a warehouse being built and I saw a sign that said hiring for FedEx. So that's going to be a FedEx warehouse. And, you know, for distribution, they wouldn't have merchandise in there for FedEx, but you know, then probably complaints about all these big structures you have to build and all the vehicles involved. Well, how do you think the stuff gets to your house? 
You know, wave a magic wand. That's right. You see, that's the thing. This huge infrastructure you have to have to have all this online stuff work. And they're building a huge FedEx. Uh, they must have had 20 truck bays on that thing. Wow. That was last, well, just last night. I saw it. I wonder what that is. And I could see the sign that said FedEx now hiring. So that's the only indicator that I had that was a FedEx warehouse. Sounds like it's going to well, be. Well, they're, they're not going to be. It's not a fulfillment center, but it's a, um, you know, it's where they're going to get all the packages sorted out. There. But it takes a huge infrastructure. It really does. To, to get this stuff to you. And people, and then someone bitches about all the trucks. Well, it's got to be somewhere. That's true. How do you get it? Otherwise. Well, and then one of the things that can help a lot is we have electric trucks. Um, oh, there's going to be a while before electric trucks are going to work that great on long haul. But for a lot of local stuff, then you cut down the diesel fumes and things like that. But we've got to have these things. And well, and there's a lot of fun stuff in there that design. <laughs> That's true. That is. I, you know, I'm, I'm glad that we talked about you know, all of the ways to kind of look at things. And, you know, um, for instance, there's, if you have an older computer, maybe your child can take it apart. And but if a apart. school doesn't have a school play, like I went to one elementary school, they didn't do school play until uh, middle school. Mm -hmm. We were doing school play in first grade. We were too. And, and for some kids, theater would be the way to go. This other girl talked to her mom and dance would have been the way to go. You see, for me, what's made life worthwhile is having an interesting career. Most funnest stuff I ever did is you sit in a job trailer and figure out how to build stuff. Let me go out and shop and try something. Sometimes it works, sometimes it didn't. That was some of the funnest stuff I ever did. Uh, I love that. Because it's just as, as important to figure out what you don't like or what doesn't well, work. Yeah, that's, I'm a big believer in exposing to a whole lot of different things. Somebody else is going to like poetry. But if they're not exposed to it, you get, get exposed to enough different things. You know, then you find out what you like. You also find out what you hate. That's, that's really, really important. It is. It is. And again, you know, I thank you so much for your time. And this has been incredibly helpful and, and fun. It's so fun to interview you. So when you, um, I, I know, you know, everyone is going to already be familiar with your work, but if they want to learn even more from you, how can they do that? Well, what I'd recommend, let's talk about some books. We already okay. talked about, about things to get kids doing stuff, the outdoor scientist and calling all minds. I'm actually going to order that one today, the outdoor okay. scientist. And that, the calling all minds is all my, my childhood aviation experiments so at a really young age. If, if you have a young child that's, um, if not talking, uh, this would be the book. It's my most basic book. A lot of little short chapters, the way I see it. In the autistic brain, I talk about the science behind object visualizer, my kind of thinking, the mathematical thinking, and the word thinking. And a lot of people are kind of mixtures. And then thinking in pictures is my autobiography. And I talk about how I got my career started. Um, I also saw Doors to Opportunity. There's a scene in the HBO movie where I walk up and I get the editor's card because I knew if I wrote for that magazine, that would really help my career. I saw that door. Too many people are pounding away on the front door, interviews and all that. No, get the job through friends. Half of all good jobs for everybody are back door or side door. A friend knows somebody. That's how they get into really good jobs. I like that. So networking for sure. Well, and networking in the community. There's more things in the community than you'd think. I mean, our parents said, well, there's no services. Well, uh, there's more stuff around than you'd think. You know, talk to people in your church, talk to some a friend that owns a shop. And the minute they're 18, I can put them to work in a shop. And if I think they're the kind that might like that, I want to get kids working right away as soon as they're legal in a paid job. The other thing I'm seeing with a lot of bulk rehab and some of the therapy community is they don't differentiate between where bagging groceries is a training job 
for one summer. And for some other clients, it is an appropriate career. But for someone like me, it's not. It's a training job. And I'm seeing where they're not getting exposed to enough higher level stuff. That makes sense. And, and I, uh, you know, I figure at the age of 70, I'll be 74 this summer. Well, I can tell you one thing. I had a problem walking around all the places they took me to in the last three days. I don't have trouble standing all day. Well, ha happy early birthday. Okay, well, but I want to help. I want to help the young. What well, you know, there's a whole interesting world of things to do out there. And then, of course, you're going to have people on the spectrum. They're not going to be designing equipment or programming computers. But I read. A, I had one person tell me about a nonverbal individual. And he loved rolling napkins at the local restaurant. They appreciated his work doing that. It's something that's real work. Another case was a nonverbal guy had been in an institution. They taught him how to make coffee at the local gas station. And everybody appreciated his really nice coffee. You see, that's doing something you're good at that other people appreciate. And then when he went to nursing home, he made the coffee for the residents there. He's the coffee man. That was his identity. I love that. And there, there really is something for everyone. Well, it's yeah, and we have to look at, you know, what they can do. And there's like some accommodations, the sensory LED lights, cheap LED lights that flicker are a big problem for certain people, not for me. I don't see them flicker. But there's other people on the spectrum that see these lights flicker. And it just, you know, it's going to give them headaches and migraines and everything else. It's just absolutely horrible seeing these lights flicker. And I, I think that is important because we always have to take but it. I I'm also want to get therapists to think about some of this stuff in a little different way. They get too stuck in the medical box. Mm -hmm. I agree. I, I think that can happen. Um, and I know that uh, my colleagues who also support um, children on the spectrum really are working hard to, you know, help the child self-advocate, to say what they want, have people listen to what they want, figuring out how to support them in a way that works best for them. Well, multitasking can be a big problem. Uh, attention shifting slowness. If you're working with little kids, you've got to give them time to respond because they're like a slow internet connection. You've got to do that. And I, uh, I, uh, clear instructions, vague instructions don't work. I the other thing you've got to watch out for, long strings of verbal directions do not work. I cannot remember them. Give them a pilot step, step one, step two, or step three. Or yeah, two, I, with I, multiple I, steps. I messed this up the other day when I had asked my older son to take the garbage out. And, and then I said, I was thinking of myself when I was thinking, reminding myself to tell him something. And then it came out and I said, and then, and he goes, wait, 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 one thing at a time. And I thought, sorry, because, <laughs> and I'm glad that but he- if you wrote it on a little piece of paper, take the garbage yeah, out and do. then uh, start doing the laundry. We usually do that. We usually, I usually have like a small index card where it'll have the lines and then the, a number and he can refer back to it as much as he wants to and needs to. Um, that happened to be like a strange situation. Yeah where I said it verbally and it, I was not paying attention. Like I should have been. Yeah. So I'm glad that he reminded me and said, Hey, wait, you know, just hold on for a second. Let me get this one thing done first. Well, that's absolutely right. Yeah. Well, again, thank you so much. And I, I greatly appreciate your time. And I know our watchers and listeners have learned so much today. Okay. Well, wonderful to talk to you. You too. Take care. All right. Thank Bye. you so much. I'm going to leave the meeting and thank you very much. Thank you for joining me today. Don't forget to click that subscribe button so you don't miss any future episodes. If you like this episode, please share it with someone. It may just be what they need to watch today. If you're a parent, I'd love if you came on over and joined our Facebook group, Autism ADHD Group for Parents. If you're a therapist or educator, come on over to our group, 
Autism ADHD group for therapists and educators. You're going to find those links right down there in the notes. Thanks so much. And I can't wait to see you in the next episode. All content provided is protected under applicable copyright, patent, trademark, and other proprietary rights. All content is provided for informational and educational purposes only. No content is intended to be a substitute for professional medical or psychological diagnosis, advice, or treatment. Information provided does not create an agreement for service between Holly Blanc Moses, Crossvine Clinical Group, the interviewee, Holly Blanc Moses, LLC, and the recipient. Consult your physician regarding the applicability of any opinions or recommendations with respect to your symptoms or medical condition or the symptoms or medical condition of your family member. Children or adults who show signs of dangerous behavior toward themselves and or others should be placed immediately under the care of a qualified professional.